Hey, my name is Marcus Smith, and I have the privilege of leading the high school teaching ministry here at Menominee Lions Church, so thank you for welcoming, welcoming me with open arms from Odessa, Texas, um, where me and my buddies drove me back up from about a month ago now, so shout out to Gabe and Travis. But as Kiki, a.k.a. Pastor Kyle, said earlier this evening, we are working our way through Psalm chapter 16 in high school youth group for the next six weeks, okay? So what I'd like to do before we jump into the psalm each week is I would actually like to read the psalm in its entirety in our hearing each evening. So next week, though, I actually don't want to read the psalm. I would like one of y'all to perhaps read the psalm if you guys are interested in it. So please let me know if you want to read the psalm. It's like 11 verses long for next week before we jump in to our lesson for next time. Or I might just start grabbing. I might just start grabbing people. So either get volunteered or voluntold. Deal? Deal. So I'm going to read Psalm chapter 16 in its entirety from the ESV tonight. Psalm chapter 16, verse 1 and following. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after other gods shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So the title of this series is just that, Pleasures Forevermore. My question for you this evening is, do you find pleasure in God? Do you rejoice and enjoy in the person of God? Not just his gifts, not just what he can provide to you, but do you rejoice in the being of God? Well, hopefully by the end of this series through Psalm chapter 16, we will be heading more in that direction in your own walk with Jesus. We're all working through Psalm chapter 16, and the series is called Pleasures Forevermore. Hopefully by the end of this series, y'all should be able to cite Verses 1 through 11, by yourself, when you need it, in the middle of a trial or an adversity. We're going to read it so many times, and hopefully this is just the the whirring in the back of your head. You could be able to uh, recite it verse by verse, okay? So we're going to take it really slow. Tonight we're just looking at verse 1. But before we jump into verse 1, I would like to give a brief, brief introduction to the Psalms and how to kind of study the Psalms. And not just the Psalms, but the Bible in general, Okay? So, first slide, please. I have three strategies, or Katniss has three strategies for us when studying the Psalms. And the first strategy is this Pray the Psalms. Pray the Psalms. All three of these start with the letter P, by the way. So, hopefully, it's a little easier to remember. But the first step in hiding the Psalms in your heart is to pray the Psalms. Psalm 119 verse 11 says, I have hidden your word in my heart that it might not sin against you. Do you hide the Bible in your heart or does it just stay here? We want to be able to make this transfer from here to here by the end of this Psalm. And one of the ways that we can do that is by praying the Psalm. For instance, when you come across a Psalm such as Psalm chapter 1 verse 2, blessed is one who meditates on God's word. That person will be blessed. And you come across that psalm and you say, Lord Jesus, help me to meditate on your word. Pray the psalms. This was the ancient prayer book of Israel. And by virtue of our faith in Jesus, it is now our prayer book. It is now our hymnal. This is designed to be sung. This is designed to be prayed. That was the original tensions of the authors, was to have these books and these chapters sung. So pray the psalms as you work your way through them. If you don't know how to pray, the Psalms are a phenomenal place to start. Let's flip to the next slide, please. Robert Godfrey, a Bible scholar, he says this about the Psalms. He says, the whole Bible is God's word to us. But the Psalms are the words God has given us to speak to him. God teaches us how to pray through the Psalter. 
There's no excuse for you not knowing how to pray. Immerse yourself, bathe yourself, soak yourself in the Psalms, and you will know how to be a prayer warrior. And the Psalms, the, Psal, uh, the, the authors of the book of Psalms, like David and some of the other people who write in this book, they say some pretty crazy stuff to God. They cry out to God. And sometimes we are too holy to say some of the things to God that the psalmists say. For instance, in Psalm chapter 88, the last verse of that psalm, he says, God, you have taken from me my closest friend, and darkness is my only companion. Have you ever been there? You ever been depressed? You ever been downcast, oh my soul? So have the psalmists. And we are to cry out to God with our emotions because God is a God of emotions. So shame on us for not crying out to him and trusting him with our emotions. Next slide, please. Number two. So first one, pray the Psalms. Number two, let the Psalms percolate in your mind. This is a stretch here, I know. Let the Psalms percolate in your mind. I'm stealing this word from my roommate in Odessa two summers ago. Whenever you would have an idea for us to go do something as roommates, and I was kind of like, I don't know if that's a great idea, man. Like, that doesn't sound very fun, or I don't, I, I, let me think about it a little bit. He said, no, 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 Marcus, just let it, let it percolate a little bit. <laughs> He's from Tennessee. He's from Tennessee. Just let it percolate. Let it marinate in your mind a little bit. Just think about it. That was his way of saying, just think about it. Just meditate on it. That's exactly what the psalmists are enjoining and commanding us to do throughout the Psalter. Let the Psalms percolate in your mind. And if you can let them percolate here, they're going to be hidden here. And you're going to be able to call on them when you need them. Okay, next slide, please. And as I was saying, Psalm chapter 1, verse 2 says this. Blessed is the one whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates. Let's it percolate. And who meditates on his law day and night. The first thing that you think about when you wake up in the morning is God and his word. The last thing that you think about before you go to bed at night is God and his word. There are no blessings in scripture, beloved, for the person who merely skims God's word or merely reads God's word. The blessings start to unearth themselves when you start to meditate on God's word and you think about it. And you apply it to yourself. What does this mean? How can I live this out tomorrow afternoon at school? That's when the blessings start to come to the surface. So number two, let the Psalms percolate in your mind, and they will transfer themselves to your heart. And finally, number three. Oh, excuse me. The Psalms are a gold mine. And you've got to dig a little bit to unearth some of the treasures there, Okay. That's another illustration, another way of meditating upon the Psalms. You have to dig. It's poetry. Poetry is not just instantly making sense to y'all. If you've ever read Shakespeare, you have to think about it a little bit, right? What does this mean? Some of you freshmen in high school had to read Shakespeare. It's awful. But it's glorious when you meditate upon it. It's glorious when you stop to think and apply it to your life. Okay? Finally, number three. The last P is this. Preach the Psalms to yourself and others. Preach the Psalms to yourself and others. Not only to others, right, like I'm having the opportunity to do now, but preach the Psalms to yourself. You have to be your own favorite preacher. Kyle cannot be your favorite pre preacher. James Cameron cannot be your favorite preacher. R.C. Sproul, John Piper, whoever it is, they cannot be your favorite preacher. You have to be your favorite preacher. And David says this in Psalm chapter 39, verse 2. As he's meditating upon the Psalms, this is what he says. He says, I remained utterly silent, not even saying anything good. He had made a pact with himself to not say anything in the presence of the wicked because he would be persecuted for saying so. And he makes a pact with himself. He says, I remained utterly silent, not even saying anything good. But my anguish increased. My heart grew hot within me. That's a byproduct of meditation upon the Psalms. You're going to want to preach them. The natural outflow of you meditating upon the Psalms would be a burning heart that wants other people to experience what you're experiencing. And it starts here. It starts with yourself. John Owen, an old Puritan writer, he used to say, the word of God will not pass with power from you if it does not dwell with power in you first. If it ain't here, it ain't going to be out there. It's like a sponge. You can't give what you don't have yourself. 
you got to be applying it and preaching it to yourself if it's going to have any power out there. Preach the word to yourself and to others. And this is how the psalm closes. He says, while I meditated, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue. The word of God is a lion. You just have to let it out of its cage. Preach the word of God after meditating upon the word of God. And he says elsewhere in this next slide, in Psalm chapter 40, one psalm later, I proclaim your saving acts in the great assembly. I do not seal my lips, Lord, as you know. I do not hide your righteousness in my heart. I speak of your faithfulness and your saving help. I do not conceal your love and your faithfulness from the great assembly. I proclaim, I do not seal, I do not hide, I do not conceal. Does that describe you? Or are you ashamed of the word of God? Are you ashamed of being a Christian? Because that concept was totally foreign to King David. When he meditated, the fire burned within him and he could not hold it in. He would grow weary of holding it in. Indeed, he could not. Next slide, please. So, those three. Pray, percolate, preach. As you work through this series in the Psalms, and by God's providence and by his goodness, we had Psalm chapter 16 today on the day we started this series. Our God knows what he's doing. Pray, percolate, or meditate, and preach the word to yourself as you go throughout it. And hopefully we'll learn how to inculcate and instill some of those Bible reading habits as we are working our way through Psalm 16. Next slide, please. So, Psalm 16.1 says this. Next slide, please. Sorry. We'll get it quicker next week, maybe. <laughs> Lord willing. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. Next slide, please. My first question off of this is what is King David, the author of this psalm, what is he asking for? Because that's a prayer. Preserve me, God. Help me, O oh God. What is David really asking for from the Lord in this first verse? Next slide, please. Is he asking for deliverance from his enemies? Rescue me, O oh God. People are pursuing me left and right, like King Saul who wants my neck right now. If you know that Bible story, King Saul was the king who wanted to kill David, and David frequently had to run from cave to cave to cave to cave, where he wrote many of these psalms because he was fearful for his life. Is he praying for deliverance from his enemies? Next slide, please. He could be. He could be. Or, next slide, is he asking for something else? Is he asking for not only deliverance from his physical enemies, as he does throughout other psalms, but is he asking for even something greater? And I think he is. There's no indication in this psalm, in the next ten verses, that he's looking for deliverance from a specific enemy. I think he's asking for something immensely greater. Next slide, please. Preserve me, O oh God. I think there's a hint in this psalm that will help us interpret this verse. Okay, we're going to take it real slow. It says this, preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. For in you I take refuge. This word for is not something that we might use in our day-to-day -day conversation. But it's a Bible word. It's a Bible conjunction that we must understand what it means if we're going to slow down and meditate on these words. Next slide, please. This word for, y'all, also means because. Because. So for example... I'm going to the store for I need to get eggs. I'm going to the store because I need to get eggs. Or if you wanted to flip that around, you could say, because I need to get eggs, I'm going to go to the store. That's what the word for means, and I think it unlocks the meaning that's going on within this text. Next slide, please. Another way that we could quote this verse is, because I take refuge in you, God, preserve me. Because I take refuge in you, don't abandon my soul to Sheol, as he's going to say later on in this text. If you're going to put me through trials, and I'm going to be chased by King Saul, keep me faithful to you. That's all I care about. God, if you're going to put me under metaphorical water in my life, give me a snorkel. Sustain me. Preserve me. Because I take refuge in you. It's about your name. I want to glorify your name. I want to celebrate you. If I fall away from you, you look worthless. So preserve me, God. I don't care about my situation. He does, of course. You can see that in other Psalms. But in the eternal sense, he's so much more focused on God than on his present circumstances. He's not just thinking here. He's thinking here. 
He's thinking in the vertical plane, I want more of God. I want to take refuge in God and make him look infinitely glorious. That is David's number one concern in this psalm. There's another word at that first, first part of that psalm. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge, right? One thing that salt does, as some of you guys know, my roommates especially, I'm such a great cook. Salt <laughs> preserves food. Salt can help preserve food. Ramen noodles, soup, it can last forever. It's also 16 days worth of sodium. Okay? 16 days worth of salt. But salt acts as a preservative. It keeps food from going stale. That's what King David is asking for. Salt me, O oh God, with your preserving grace so I don't quit on you. I want to be a Christian just as much tomorrow as I am today. Help me to do that, God. Because if it's up to me, ultimately and fully and finally, I will fall away from you. God, you got to help me here. I need you. That's David's chief concern. Preserve, salt me, God, with your sustaining grace. I think that's what David's concerned about. So another way to say this, keep me from falling away from you. That's what I care about. Next slide, please. Do your prayers sound like David's? Do you pray this desperately? Or are you only concerned about getting out of your situation, getting delivered from your situation or the people that are persecuting you, saying awful things about you at school? Are you only concerned about that? Or is your ultimate concern to not fall away from God? It's not wrong to pray for deliverance, y'all, as he does in other psalms. But our ultimate prayer is that he'd preserve us in faith and trusting in God. Next slide, please. So I have a question based off of this psalm now. We kind of did a little exposition or meditation on it. That's kind of what it looks like and, and feels like when you slow down and think about the words and apply it to yourself. I have a question based off of this word. Because he's talking about his salvation here. Keep me in faith, God. Help me to not be a non-Christian or a non-believer tomorrow. Help me to that end, God. That's what he's praying. So I have a question based off of this psalm for David. And the question is this. Can a genuine Christian lose their salvation? That's our question this evening that we're going to wrestle with for the majority of the last few moments of this message. Can a genuine Christian, I'm not talking about someone whose faith is fake. Someone who just prays a prayer or makes a decision, and they show forth no fruit, no evidence that they're actually a genuine Christian. I'm talking about a genuine Christian who has put their faith in Christ, who's been sealed by Christ, who's trusted in Christ, who's willing to live for Christ and die for Christ. Can that person lose their salvation? And the answer to that question is quite simply, no, they can't. Because, beloved, you didn't do anything to gain your salvation in the first place. You didn't do anything to earn or merit your salvation in the first place. Therefore, you cannot unearn your salvation. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 says that he who begins a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. What God starts, he finishes, and that's the end of the story. You will not fall away fully or finally from grace. Next slide, please. I have two passages to support this, okay? One from the lips of Jesus. And one from the psalmist, who just happens to be David, okay? Which, by the way, everything written in the Bible is Jesus' words, okay? But David is just physically writing these in, in that moment. So the two passages here. John chapter 10, Jesus talking about the sheep. We just talked about this in church a couple weeks ago, all right? But Jesus says this to support the idea and the concept that you cannot fall away from grace. You cannot fall away fully or finally from Christ if you are a true, genuine Christian, okay? He says this. Jesus is talking, I give them eternal life. Talking about his sheep, talking about us, his elect predestined people to faith. If you are in Christ and you've put your faith in Christ, this verse concerns you. If you're not in Christ, I pray that you repent tonight and the Lord gives you no sleep until you do. I give them, my people, my sheep, eternal life, and they shall never perish. Never is a universal negative, y'all. It will never, ever happen. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Notice something here. Jesus says, nobody will snatch them out of my hand. 
My father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my father's hand. You've got the hand of Jesus. You've got the hand of God on top of it. And to pull another verse in here, the Holy Spirit wraps you. He wraps all this up. He seals it up. He seals you for the day of redemption. You've got the Father. You've got the Son. You've got the Holy Spirit. If you can lose your salvation, that is blasphemy. That's saying that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit's work are not effective enough. He's bringing everybody in here. Now notice this. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. No one can do it. For any of you guys that grew up in English class and you ask your English teacher, uh, can I go to the bathroom? What are they going to say? May I? May I go to the bathroom, right? Because may is asking for permission. May I go to the bathroom, right? That's the proper way to ask your English teacher, may I go, is may I go to the bathroom? If you say, can I go to the bathroom, that's a functional bodily question. If you can't go to the bathroom, you've got bigger problems. You can't physically do it, okay? That's what Jesus is saying here. No one can do it. Not just that they might, or not just what they will, like he says up here, he brings it even fuller circle here. No one can do it, ever. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor powers, neither present, nor the future, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to snatch you from God's love that is in Christ Jesus, Romans chapter 8 says. Neither relationship starting, or relationship ending. Neither your parents' divorce or fill in whatever the heck else you want to fill in there will be able to snatch you from God's love for you in Christ Jesus. If you're in Christ, you're sealed. There's nothing that could ever snatch you from your Father's hand. Next slide, please. We don't even have to go outside the Psalms to recognize this reality. There's a couple Psalms later, Jesus says this. He says, excuse me, David directly says this. He says, the steps of a person are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. Do you want your life to make some sort of sense? Do you want to make some sort of difference in the world? Do you want the Lord to lead you and guide you and counsel you with his loving eye upon you? Well, then delight in him. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and he will lead you and he will guide you. But if you're one of the wicked, like the next verse we're going to look at says, he's not going to do any of that for you. Sorry, let's go back to that first slide. Sorry about that, Shannon. Shannon, you're doing awesome. Thank you. Um, Though he fall, he shall not be cast headlong, for the Lord upholds his hand. So even though, y'all, you will stumble and you will sin and you will mess up at times, you will never fall away fully or finally. You might backslide into seasons of sin, and that's definitely not the goal. But you will never fall headlong. And that same word is used of Judas Iscariot. When he betrays Jesus, he goes and he buys a field for himself with the money that he's earned and he hangs himself from a tree and says that he falls headlong to the ground and his intestines split out of his body. That will not be you in regards to your faith. You will not fall headlong. But the Lord will sustain you because he holds you with his hand. If you fall down, he's not letting go. The reason that you will be a Christian tomorrow if you are one today is because the Lord will hold on to your hand. Not because you'll hold on to his He ain't letting go. He ain't snatching even yourself out of his hand. You're locked in. You're locked in. Next slide, please. For the Lord loves justice. He will not forsake his saints. They are preserved forever, but the children of the wicked shall be cut off. Notice this about this psalm. It says that the Lord loves justice here. He will never forsake his saints. What does that have to do with anything? Justice and forsaking his children? Those things don't match. Or do they? Would God be a good, loving God if he were to forsake his children? He would not be. In fact, we have laws in this country that punish parents who forsake and leave their children. Justice must be given out to those types of people. But the Lord... He loves justice. Therefore, I'm not forsaking my saints. I'm not forsaking my children. If you're in Christ, if you trusted Christ with your life, you are his saint. This is not talking about some Catholic church veneration where you put them on a stained glass window of sainthood. If you're in Christ, which we'll talk about next week, you are a saint. 
He loves justice. He's a just God who does not forsake his children because he's a responsible parent. For the Lord loves justice, he will not forsake his saints. They are preserved how long? Forever. But the children of the wicked, they're going to be cut off. They might make a confession of faith. They might say that they're believers. They might even go to church. But they'll be cut off. And our Lord Jesus Christ will tell them on the day of judgment. He will say, away from me, you evildoer. I never knew you. But they say, no, we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We did many mighty works in your name. He said, I don't care. I never had a relationship with you. You weren't one of my saints. You didn't trust in me. You didn't love me. Therefore, go away to hell. For the Lord loves justice, and he will not forsake his saints. Next slide, please. Now, why does David pray for the Lord to preserve him? If God's going to do it, why does he need to pray that God would do it? That makes no sense to me. David, why are you going to pray if God's sovereign? If God's in control and he's already guaranteed that he's not going to snatch you out of his hand, that makes no sense. Next slide, please. The reason that David prays this way is because David has a heart that wants to persevere. He's got a heart that wants to trust in God. I'm just going to be honest. Not every church agrees with this doctrine, by the way. That when you're once saved, you're always saved. In fact, I just worked in a church where that denomination believes that you can lose your salvation. I don't think that's biblical. But I had a buddy one time who asked me, he said, Marcus, the logical conclusion of telling somebody that they're never going to lose their salvation, the logical conclusion of that is they're going to go out and live a hellbound lifestyle. They're going to sleep around. They're going to drink. They're not going to do anything that's God-pleasing because you told them, oh, they will never lose their salvation. But the thing is, y'all, this guy does not understand that when the Lord saves you, he changes your heart. If you are a true Christian, you desire righteousness. You desire to go out and live for Christ and lay down your life for him. You can't not pursue righteousness. Your desires are different. You have spiritual taste buds. And if you don't have any spiritual taste buds and you could care less about righteousness, you need to check your heart to see if you're actually in Christ to begin with. David has a heart that wants to pray. And that's how God sustains him is through even his prayers and his desires. If he changes you, he changes your heart, changes your desires, he's going to sustain you through those desires. Next slide, please. So, in closing here. Maybe you are in Christ here. Maybe you are a Christian tonight. And as I said earlier, if you're not a Christian tonight, I pray that the Lord would give you no sleep until you are. But if you are a Christian tonight, perhaps you feel like you can't hold on during this season. You just can't hold on to Christ. You're about to quit on him. Your family just went through something. You say, God, that's the last straw. That's the straw that's breaking the camel's back here. I'm leaving you. And maybe you're at that level right now. I want to encourage you with one passage from the book of Isaiah. There's many passages. We only looked at a couple tonight. But I want to look at one passage and that talks about how the Lord will never leave you or forsake you. Which, oddly enough, is another passage. (laughs) But next slide, please. Isaiah chapter 42, verse 3 says this. A bruised reed he will not break. And a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. Some of y'all's faith looks like this right now. 